All right, I'm going to stay on housing. Come on in, David Barnson. He's the Barnson Group CIO. Look, I can identify the problems with housing. Uh, rising prices, mortgage rates getting up there a little bit, shortage of supply coming onto the market. Mm -hmm. But is there something else going on in housing? For example, David, are millennials buying homes the way 20 and 30-somethings used to buy homes? Well, the answer to that question is obviously no, they're not. And there's a number of reasons for that. One is economic and the others are more social and cultural. But I'm so afraid of offending you and my good friends there on set with you. I don't believe these things are a problem at all. I, I am so mystified by why we talk about housing as if permanently escalating housing prices above and beyond wage growth, above and beyond any supply-demand reality could possibly be a good thing for the economy. A slowdown, a correction, a moderation of housing prices is a very good thing for 30-somethings who want to buy a home. Mm. There are so many people in this country that make a good living that cannot afford to buy a home. Now, what do we want to do? We want to deteriorate credit standards or, or eliminate down payments. I think we tried that once. It didn't go very well. It certainly didn't end very well. Mm. Uh, a housing market of permanently escalating prices is not an economically good thing. It's a distortion. We have basically right now have a housing market that got ahead of itself and it's coming to reality. I would just like to see more sales of existing homes. An annualized rate of 5.2 million is hardly strong. I remember back in the good old days when you get 6 million mm. existing homes sold and that was 10 years ago. Uh, but, but Stuart, was that the good old days 10 years ago? I mean, we had more people buying homes than could afford to buy homes 10 years ago. Certainly 12, 13, you know, in, in the years building up to the financial crisis. What I think is that we have an affordability problem. We need to have more inventory. And, and I'm not suggesting you want lack standards on underwriting. I think that we want people who can afford to buy a home buying a home. But you brought up the millennial issue. It is the lack of affordability for good earning millennials is to enter the home market. That's not a good thing. And right. culturally, they're waiting longer to get yep. married. They're waiting longer to have kids. There's more of a willingness and even kind of an attraction to renting and living in big cities. They value their flexibility. So household formation is going to be very different over the next 20 years than it was the 20 years, you know, as I was coming into my adult years. Mm. I think there's a lot of moving parts here, Stuart. Fair point, David. By the way, I want to tell our viewers that later this hour, Housing and Urban Development Secretary Ben Carson will be on the show. I want his take on housing. All right, back to you, David. The markets right now, we're up 140 points. Not much of a rebound from the big losses of the last two days. Do you think we've seen the bottom? Oh, I don't know. I mean, obviously, I would never be able to guess on something like that. I don't imagine so. There's no particular reason to think that a bottom's been put in place. But these things are very unpredictable. I'm surprised the market's been able to rally at all today with all nine people that must be working on Wall Street today. <laughs> <laughs> well, we're here. But, but, yes, you are. Uh, but the fact of the matter is, is that there's no catalyst to growth until we get a GDP print that shows CapEx and business investment has indeed reverted to the trajectory it was on in Q1 and Q2. It slowed way down in Q3. I believe that's because of fears around the trade war. There, we brought back in a business uncertainty that was wholly unnecessary. The fact of the matter is the economy is still on strong footing. But right now, there's just a kind of wait and see approach. Get a China trade deal done. Get strong CapEx going again. Then you go into the next earnings season in Q1. I think the market resumes upward trajectory. Right now, I just think you bounce around. Now, I know that you're an investor who likes, uh, likes stocks which have a growing dividend, a strong dividend and a dividend that grows. So tell me, are there any retailers, because they were beaten down badly yesterday, they're not doing terribly well today, are there any retailers that pay a solid, strong dividend that goes up in the future? So we separate the what we consider consumer discretionary names, which I'm not sure that I've really ever owned one in my career. They're sort of intrinsically bad dividend payers, bad dividend growers. Uh, usually they're very indebted companies and they're more, you know, fad and trend oriented. 
versus consumer staples, which we would consider Walmart to be kind of the king in that space. Well, you don't get much better dividend growth than what Walmart's done. Uh, they began growing their dividend in 1973, and they haven't stopped since. Hmm. Uh, they have checked back over the last week, and it's hard to be able to kind of extrapolate what is just related to the overall market drop and what is specific to theirs, because they actually had a very strong quarter, and their e-commerce numbers were up 43%. Yeah. If there's anybody in this country really competing toe-to-toe with Amazon, it's Walmart. But that's our strong retailer name. And uh, from a balance sheet standpoint, they get a nice premium valuation because they're so uh, well-run, they execute very well, and their financials are at a different level of strength. I don't know whether you invest in the big tech stocks or ISIS. I suspect you don't because n- not many of them pay a strong dividend, if any at all. But they've been hit lately. Tiny rebound today. Is this the time, in your opinion, I know that you're not an investor in this area, but would you buy any of them? Well, see, big tech, meaning Cisco and Intel, Qualcomm is not one we own now, but that's a very good dividend grower over the years. Uh, frankly, Apple has been a huge dividend grower, and they're now down $50 a share in the last couple months. So, yes, I do think that there are names like that worth buying that are incredible dividend growers. And obviously, we've talked about Microsoft over the years as becoming this real stable dividend grower. The problem with the types of companies you're referring to, which is basically the FANG kind of names, and I'll throw NVIDIA in there, is they don't have the free cash flow to be able to pay a sustainable dividend. They're far too cyclical in their earnings generation, and they've really relied on just high momentum to push their stock prices higher. So we would say no to that space, even at these prices, um, and then we would say yes to the Intel's, Cisco's, and those types of tech names. Again, I've used the phrase on your show a lot, old tech. Old. It's boring tech, but it's really very reliable. <laughs> and you can look at its outperformance over new tech over the last seven weeks. It's been phenomenal. David, you make a lot of sense. And we want to take time to wish you and yours a wonderful Thanksgiving. Thank you, Stuart. Happy Thanksgiving to all of you. See Aww. you soon. Mm. See you soon. <laughs>